this presentation is all about rugby and this is applying breathing techniques and maybe if you're a rugby player or if you're in team sports you you may ne never have thought about what breathing can do to help with your performance so joining me this morning is david jackson who is a former pro rugby so welcome dave um, and just to give a little bit of background so that people know where you're coming from. Yeah, um, so I played uh, for Nottingham in the Championship uh, in England, played over 300 games, retired in 2013 uh, because of a head injury, uh, which um, subsequently found out that that has played a little bit of habit with some of my own breathing patterns and habits and had to uh, thankfully being trained by Patrick and, the, and part of the Oxford Advantage coaching or the advanced instructors to be able to, um, yeah, improve my own but then now using that to go okay man if i knew this when i played rugby like i mm. was i was fit when i played rugby but we, yeah. we paid no attention to whether i was breathing through the nose or the mouth no attention to how breathing could impact my recovery let yeah. alone how the breath holding could improve uh repeat sprint abilities anaerobic yeah. like capacity that sort of stuff um yeah. yeah we we did it all through grit and determination and uh i wish i had some of these to, and we did a lot of you know yeah, I, I could tell you some stories of people throwing up at training because that's just that's how you that's when you got into the red zone, as we called yeah. it. But um, yeah, it, it's been great also to sh start to share this with um, now with, you know, other professional players that are, uh, um, are coming up through and looking for, you know, we talk about one percenters. We were just talking before we come around about mm -hmm. one percenters, but uh, I think people are searching one percenters. But this is I see this as a far greater than a, than a one percenter yeah. and people are noticing the difference within literally within a week, a couple of yeah. sessions, like starting yeah. to just change the way we breathe and improving uh, some of the recovery, the effect on sleep. And then also some of the breath holding just to like maximize the work you're doing um, on the training field. So yeah, no, excited yeah. to talk a little bit more about it from, uh, well, from you, the master. Great stuff. Well, we're not going to have a two way conversation. So for any of the viewers, stick with us because you're going to get some great nuggets of information here. We're putting it out there um, and you can start practicing it yourself and you will know straight away, you know, the, the, the body will tell you. So we're sharing a presentation here and just one second there. So in an overview, this is breathing practice, more specifically the oxygen advantage, and where exactly, when can we bring this into a rugby field and rugby match practice, rugby training, etc. So Jacko, during the warm up, it's normal that players will have pre-match anxiety. Yeah. And through the breath, what we can do is, so for example, if a player is warming up, the best thing to do is to bring breathing exercises into the warm up itself. So they're not adding anything new to their warm up. Yeah, so it literally like as you say it can it can be it can be just be part of what we're doing in the warm ups rather than having yes. to be an additional thing during the warm up, you know, we're doing low level stuff, we're just like get preparing uh, preparing the body, but equally, you know, we're supposed to the warm up is supposed to prepare the mind for what we're going to do as well. Uh, and we know that that's important when we're getting taught that at GCSE PE uh, back when I was at school, it's like a warm up is about preparing the body and the mind, but we say that, but then we don't actually really do anything for the mind. So how do we help ourselves focus, get better awareness and attention, but at the same time, not get either too over the top aroused or struggle with, I played over 300 games of professional rugby and I still would get nervous before any of them. Um, yeah. And, you know, I know I, I had, there was a guy that played with who he would be sick because of his nerves before every yeah. single game yeah. Um, yeah. because we didn't actually have tools to, deal with and understand how to um yeah how to control those and balance those and are you someone yeah. that needs to get a little bit more ramped up or uh, do you need to be able to calm yourself down and the breath is a great way to to manage those that sort of yeah um yeah. stress response yeah so i'd say to players you know if you're doing a warm-up even if you're doing low intensity start off with your hands either side of the lower ribs keep them out closed and as you're breathing in gently feel your lower ribs moving out and as you're breathing out, gently feel your lower ribs moving in. And as you're breathing in, gently feel the lower ribs moving out. And as you breathe out, gently feel the lower ribs moving in. What this helps to do is this will calm the nerves. Now, I know we want to go into a match in flow state. And flow state is where the mind is in a state of relaxation, but alert at the same time. So we are doing calm breathing. 
which is involving nose breathing, slow breathing, and low breathing. And it's not about taking fast and shallow breaths. If you have an athlete going into a game, and if they're breathing fast and shallow, if their breathing is agitated, the mind is agitated. So during your warm up, no matter what you're doing during the warm up, in and out through the nose, and as you breathe in, the lower ribs gently moving out. And as you breathe out, the lower ribs gently moving in. And after about three, four, five minutes of that, then do take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold and hold your breath for about 10 to 15 paces during the warm up. So it's continuous movement. Wait a minute then after that breath hold and repeat it. So again, you do take a normal breath in through your nose, out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold and hold your breath for about 10 to 15 paces. And then resume breathing in through your nose and continue your warm up with nasal breathing. After about a minute of that, then do a stronger breath hold. Because remember what we want to do is we want to alter states. We want to relax body and mind first. Then we want to stress the body a little bit. And then we want to give a fair stress to the body. And now we're gonna give a fair stress to the body with longer breath holds. You take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold. Go into a walk, into a jog, into a fast jog. Keep holding, keep relaxing, keep pushing, keep relaxing, keep pushing. When the air hunger gets pretty strong, let go in through your nose and get your breathing under control and continue moving with gentle movement, semi-active recovery, and repeat five strong breath holds with a minute's rest in between each. So, Jacko, we often talk about what that's doing. It's going to open up the nose, mm. which athletes are going to feel it straight away. But it's also increasing blood flow to the brain. So it's making us more concentrated. And one important factor is that it's causing the spleen to contract. Yeah. And the spleen is the blood bank, 8% of the red blood cells. And even doing a breath hold for 30 seconds, the spleen is releasing red blood cells into circulation. And this is improving um, oxygen carrying capacity and it takes about between different studies between 10 to 60 minutes for the spleen to reabsorb that back but the warm-up is about really preparation not just for the body but preparation mm. as you were talking about for the mind yeah and we can influence mind states if we breathe slow we calm the mind if we do strong breath holds we stress the body and we increase blood flow to the mind and we generate that state pre-warm-up. So yeah. simple and, tools that people could do. Yeah, and, and as you say, like with the from a almost like the um the physical perspective of going that that spleen after 30 seconds releasing a little bit more of blood cells, like we want that extra oxygen carrying capacity as we're as we're going into the into the match. And if you've one thing I really there's two things I really like about this from a a pre-match perspective is you, you're getting that physical physiological like response straight away and yes. um if you've been making five breath holds for 30 seconds as part of your practice um in your general warm-ups before if you're you know if you're if you're a rugby player and you're you're probably doing some sort of training most days and so it's not difficult to get those five things in and you'll notice that at the start you know <laughs> for me two years ago and I started trying to do 20 steps, which was probably like 10 seconds was difficult. But after, once you build up and get used to it, you could, it can start to be quite comfortable to do a 30 second breath hold. Um, and so we can get those in quite comfortably. It gives you something to, as you say, to focus the mind. And then the, there's one other important fact that I'm seeing with people, uh, so some of the professional guys that I've been working with, where we're trying to break these bad habits of that like short, shallow breath, particularly when we're trying to recover our breathing. So We've, we're halfway through the match and we've sprinted for something or whatever it is. And we've got some downtime in the game to recover our breathing. But the habit that we've generated for, for many years is <sighs> that, that fast, shallow panting breath, which isn't as efficient. It's not going to help us um, with recovery and getting oxygen into, into the cells to, to help with that recovery process. So if you think of at the end of that strong breath hold, you let go of the nose. What's the first thing you want to do? <gasps> you want to breathe in like that. So actually I use it with them to go, right, you've got your six recovery breaths after this, but I want you to use it as a way to teach yourself and to practice and just go, right, tell the, that sort of like that habit and tell the brain like when I'm gasping for air and I want to do that <laughs> short, shallow breath, I'm going to let go, breathe in through the nose, but it's going to be from deep and it's going to be longer and it's going to be, so I'm actually working on my breathing, uh, I guess, mechanics and breathing patterns for 
when I am going to be wanting to go to that panting breath because I'm really struggling with my recovery, but yeah. I'm using it as a tool to help teach me that, um, even just even just as part of my warm. So the more times we regularly do these things, you just embed those good habits. And so, yes. you know, when you're on the pitch during the game, you're not going to be really wanting to think about these things, but you've generated that that good habit to help recover your breathing. So it's it's a, it, it, it's quite simple as you say, but it's it's quite multifaceted in what you're going to be able to get out of it. Um, there's yeah. there's a ton of stuff you do um, before a game or in training, and even whether it's training on the field or whether it's in the gym, where you're doing some low level activation work and low le- low level um, movements, uh, lunge patterns, and whatever it is at that that beginning stage of your of your warm ups, where you know you could you could comfortably do a little bit of um, nasal breathing, a little bit of of breath holding without interrupting anything else that's that's mm-hmm. going on. So. Uh, think and it's everyone's warm up is slightly going to be individualized to some degree so there's a little bit of emphasis on you as a player just feel where it fits in uh comfortably for you i would say yeah you made a great point there the player's breathing on the field is going to be influenced by their breathing outside of the field 100 percent. so say for example if you have a player that's a little bit prone to anxiety or a little bit prone to childhood asthma or asthma or bronchoconstriction or just if they have a breathing pattern in general it's their breathing during sleep. It's their breathing during the day, which in turn is influencing how breathless day will experience on a football field, on a rugby yeah. field. So, well, I, Patrick, I had a guy, uh, one, of the, one of the players we've been working with, he um, did struggle with um, a little bit of anxiety. And he, would know, mm. he um, had like an aura ring and would take his resting heart rate and all that sort of stuff. He was quite into all of that. So he had some good data already. And, and he, um, three weeks of practicing some of the breathing light after training for recovery. And we'll talk about that later, yes. I guess. And, uh, but with some breath holding, some, some breathing light before bed as well, he noticed that um, his resting heart rate within three weeks, we did three sessions, um, had dropped by over 10 beats per minute. Yeah. And, and, and straight away I asked him like, and did you, did you, do you notice that you feel like slightly less anxious? And he was like, Oh, hundred percent feel like totally mm. calmer. And actually his coach had, had said that he was that, that anxiety um, th- that he would just have as a bit of a, a low level thing going on. Like you would see it in the way he was like playing, that the, the agitation, the little bit of stress and him being able to calm that down um, has been, yeah, it's been fantastic for him. Yeah. 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 No, great. We're going to just move on to another couple of points here. So we spoke about increasing alertness and during play itself. Now there has been some small studies looking at if players are breathing through their nose, especially with low intensity um, physical movement, that nasal breathing is helping to improve visual spatial awareness. And this was, were studies carried out in Israel. This is very, very important for team, team sports. This is when the player has the eye on the ball, but is also aware of everything that's going on around them. Yeah. And if yeah, you can't, and you think for, for a contact sport like rugby, uh, how important how important that is not just for um like you being able to aware of like where your teammates are but where the opposition are to actually like yeah exploit exploit gaps and exploit opportunities but equally you know yeah. i know that i had my i had my head injury because i got hit by something that i didn't see coming um and so yeah. that's yeah. that's one of the things with uh, with with concussions you're most likely to get a concussion when you're not braced for the impact and you're most likely to be unbraced for an impact when you haven't seen it coming. So yeah. the more we can improve that spatial awareness yeah. um, and, and, the, and the visual aspect of that, the better. Do you know there's another side to this as well? And that's sleep quality. That sleepy players are more likely to be injured. Mm. And it's because you don't have your full attention on the game because you can't have your attention there. And we will talk about that. Yeah. Um, so I could, we'll keep going with a couple of extra points here. So, for example, during recovery then, we want to be able to bring the heart rate down and one way through the breath is again after the game or and i would say to players is really to bring this into your training sessions first and start experimenting with it but if you want to bring your heart rate down this was notified or this was documented first in 1921 when one researcher i think his name was lowey he isolated the heart of a frog and he stimulated the vagus nerve it releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and it caused the heart rate to slow down. So any player who's coming from the pitch back to the dressing room, they should be using that as a recovery. And one way would be in and out through the nose. And even just, you don't have to be doing anything visual. Nobody knows you're doing it. 
but breathing in through the nose and having a really slow and prolonged exhalation. And even though you're a bit gassed out coming from the pitch into the, into the dressing room, at the same time, making it the exhalation a little bit longer is going to stimulate the vagus nerve. It's, it's secreting the neurotransmitter and the body then is going into relaxation and the heart rate is going to come down. But that's also very good for the mind. Yeah. So there's, there's times there that, you know, when we think of the breath itself, the inhalation is more sympathetically driven. It's more of a stress response. The vagus nerve steps back, but the exhalation is more under the control of the body's relaxation response. And if we want to top, tap into recovery, whether it's recovery post sprint, whether it's recovery in between, you know, off the ball, whether it's recovery coming back to the dressing room, it's all about extending the exhalation. And it's in and out through the nose. It's not in through the nose and out through the mouth. If you breathe in through your nose, and if you breathe out through your mouth, the, mouth, the breath is going to come out fast. Yeah. So your nose is naturally slowing down breathing. And those are simple hacks that people, players can be, play, players can be doing and nobody even knows that yeah. they're doing it. And you, you're going to be getting, there's going to be an improvement in the efficiency of oxygen delivered to the cells, right? In terms of, yes. you know, if, if, where you can explain it about dead space, like by taking those slower breaths, you, you're yes. not losing as much air. It'd be good to just touch base on that there. Yeah, totally. So for example, if we consider that every breath that you, we take into the body, not all of that air gets down into the small air sacs in the lungs where gas exchange takes place. Of the last 150 mil of every breath stays in what's called dead space. So it stays in the nasal cavity or in the throat, in the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles. If you're breathing fast and shallow, so say, for example, you were taking 20 breaths per minute, just as an example, and the size of the breath was 300 mil, 300 mil it means that you are, you're breathing six liters. And if you then want to find out how much of that air is actually getting into the small air sacs in the lungs, you have to subtract dead space. And this would be 20 multiplied by 300 minus 150, which is giving you three liters. So this individual is breathing fast and shallow, and they're wasting 50% of the air that they are breathing in. So in order to optimize breathing, to be efficient with breathing, to be economical with breathing, it's about breathing slow, it's about breathing nose, and it's about breathing low. And you don't have to be thinking about these things because if you start just practicing it and being conscious of this in practice, this naturally becomes your normal way to breathe. You know, yeah. forget about the ideas that people have about taking full big breaths doesn't increase your oxygen uptake yeah. in the blood. It's not increasing oxygen delivery to the tissues. The more air you breathe, the more carbon dioxide you, you blow off, you remove it from the blood through the lungs. Blood vessels constrict. And, you know, nasal breathing, Jacko, it's very much underrated. And really, when we come back to what does the mouth do in terms of breathing, it does nothing, zero. Yeah. You know, and I, I think, understand high intensity, you have to mouth breathe yeah. when the intensity is too high. But what about all of those lower gears yeah. that you can maintain nasal breathing? And, it, and in rugby, in a game or in training, you've got all of that. Rugby is the perfect sport for this because... The, the ball is in play for like such a small amount of time generally. And so we have all this downtime. There's, there's, a, there's a scrum up in there. Or we're getting ready for the scrum. We're getting ready for the line out. Whatever else is going on, we have all these downtimes in playing just because automatically when you don't think about it, when you're a little bit gassed, you go to <laughs> that short, shallow breathing yes. that you're talking about. Like you're just showing that from, you could potentially be wasting half of the breath you're taking in. So just yeah. because it's auto, that's what you sort of automatically go to doesn't mean it's the, the right thing to do. Yes. And I think there's, there's, a, there's another little thing on top of this that uh, if you see like your opponents and they're all like, <sighs> and you're getting ready to go into a scrum and you're not like that, you, yeah. you know you've got them there on toast. I was talking to a, um, a guy who's a, an MMA um, in, uh, teacher. Um, yes. He was saying one of his one of the one of his very good students that he spars with. He goes, I know as soon as I switch to mouse breathing, like I'm absolutely toast. Like they've got yeah. me. He knew that yeah. intuitively. Yeah. And you and people watching this will will know if if you don't know anything about um, you haven't come across this really at all before or thought about it. You'll know when you see those guys and you and you, you see your opposition. You know you've got them yeah. when they've gone to that mouth breathing. You might not have necessarily realised, but there's something. There's something yes. intuitively that we see yeah. that and they, you know, so from your own point of view, 
even if you're feeling like <laughs> I'm absolutely yeah. dying, I don't know if I can hang on, but you mentally take control of your breathing, improve, slow down that breathing, make it nasal, as you're saying, you're going to get all those physiological like improvements in yes. terms of bore oxygen, but equally mentally, you yourself are going to feel better, but then you're giving um, an aura to the opposition of like, I've got more in the tank. Yeah. Here. I'm not, yeah. I'm not yeah. gassed yet. So I think that there's, yeah. There's the mindset and the, the mind games that go on in that that yeah. I think are really beneficial. Yeah, a couple of great points there. Number one is, how can we improve our ability and our endurance and exercise tolerance and repeated sprint ability? And we must talk about that. Yeah. And I think it is very important that, as the point that you're saying, it is an indicator of fatigue when you're gassed out. Mm. And we also, you, you brought up the scrum, which is very interesting because there's a lot of power in that. And we have to I've only been in one. <laughs> when everyone else was in, I had to go on the back and I was like, well, ah! that's, one I was more, that's one more than I've been in. So, <laughs> but if we think of the diaphragm, not just in respiration, but the diaphragm, we have one of our instructors who is working with an international football team that everybody knows, um, but I don't want to divulge it because that's just the way it is. Yeah. But with regards he spoke about the players strengthening their diaphragm is where he's seeing some benefits here. And when we think about this main breathing muscle here, if we've got functional breathing, we have functional movement. And if we have functional movement, we've reduced risk of injury. But the diaphragm is also providing that stabilization for the spine. And with a normal inhalation, the diaphragm is moving downwards, the intercostal muscles are pulling out. And then with the normal exhalation, the diaphragm is moving back up to its resting position. And that then in turn is influencing the zone of opposition, which is influencing intra-abdominal pressure. And we need strong and thick diaphragms to be able to prov provide that stabilization yeah. for the spine. So it's one thing, you know, in terms of, well, I suppose people think we about it. It's a muscle and we don't train muscle. it. We train yes. all the other muscles in the body and we get them super yes. strong, but we don't think of it as, um, yeah, the, the core to be able to stabilize the spine has been yeah in, in functional sports and things like very important, but yeah, there's that deeper layer and that understanding of the, the role that the diaphragm plays in that. So not only strengthening yeah. it, but even there's probably a little bit just before that, but like if you're, if you're breathing quite poorly and the diaphragm isn't working that well, then it's unlikely that it's, um, that it's strong. It's unlikely that it's yeah. actually created, you know, being able to participate in creating that, that spinal stability that, that you're talking about. So yeah, get it, get it moving and get it working efficiently and then get it, get it strong from that point yeah. of view. And then also we know that stronger muscles fatigue less as well. So yes. you're, it's going to be, you're going to be able to use it for longer. Yeah. So, and what happens when the diaphragm fatigues, but blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm breathing yeah. is going to trump everything. You know, breathing is the more, it's like, it's, it's that vital function in the human body. And other functions are going to be secondary in order yeah. that the body is expanding yeah. it, you know, in supporting yeah. breathing. But my point is then how can we increase the strength of the diaphragm? And there's a few different ways. One is having optimal breathing patterns. And that is nose because if you breathe through your mouth, you typically engage more of the upper chest and there's less recruitment of the diaphragm. But if you had an athlete that goes for a run with their mouth closed, and this is going to be interesting because, Jacko, maybe a lot of the viewers have never considered going for a run with the mouth closed. It's tough, but you're adding an extra load onto the diaphragm to impose that, imp increase that strength and increase function, but also to improve the body's tolerance to carbon dioxide. So when athletes are going for a run with the mouth closed, what are they experiencing? Um, well, I know like to start with, if you, you know, if you if you're quite a good breather and you use your nose generally, you actually probably will be able to take to and go, oh, it's, it's not too bad. And you might even without realizing it, we would normally breathe through your nose when you're jogging anyway, but for a lot of us, we don't use it and it's really blocked and it's really congested. And actually it's just an absolute snot fest where you try to do it. And, and, and you, you may even at the very beginning, like hardly run at all and be like, I can't even carry on doing this. And so you know, there's some of the nose and blocking drills that you do um, and the, the breath holding themselves help to lose uh, to, to de decongest it. And genuinely, as long as you work, if you're going to be consistent with it over time, it starts to become very comfortable and actually then starts to feel far more enjoyable. You feel 
like at a low level, you feel like you could run forever. And I think I put down a lot of that down to where, what you mentioned before about that efficiency of oxygen delivery into the cells. You're not getting to that, that level of breathlessness and you're, you're not going to that panting that you, um, that you sort of might have gone to in the past that doesn't get you as much oxygen in. So you don't get to that point where you're like, I, 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 I can't go anymore. So that our, our ability to carry on going for longer, particularly at lower levels, um, uh, increases massively. And if you, if you're, if you're using, if you use breat yo going in out through the nose, you're utilizing the diaphragm like you mentioned. We're getting some of that stabilization of the spine and the pelvis. So our running economy can be a little bit more efficient as well. That will help with efficiency of just keeping going, but potentially even some some speed um, improvements because a more stable base is going to allow you to put more force down through uh, through the through into the floor from your legs. Um, and uh and your uh the, the whole thing is going to get easier the longer you do it for it does so, and this is a good point because when you switch from mouth to nose breathing it's pretty tough at the start at first it's horrible and it's for about, <laughs> six, it's for about six weeks or so and then the air hunger but this is the training load like athletes are going to they understand if i want to condition something i add an extra load onto it mm. So when I switch from mouth to nose breathing, that's that's a pretty strong load, mm. a strong load in terms of the blood gases. So, for example, now the other thing is people with rugby will have many will have deviated septums, but many will be able to functionally breathe through their nose. Now, if they have a very poor deviate, very poor functioning of the nose, what I would say is get nasal dilators, wear a breathe right strip. So it works something like this. You're just gently prizing your nostrils apart. Now, if you have a stuffy nose, you can unblock it, as you pointed out, and that's during the breath hold. So to unblock the nose, take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold, and start walking. Or go for a, go for a light jog, holding your breath, and keep going until you have a strong air hunger. Then let go, breathe in through your nose, get your breathing recovered, and do it five or six times. Your nose will open up. The one thing about the stuffy nose is that if you have a stuffy nose, your sleep is likely to be impacted. And we will come back to that later because yeah. sleep disorder breathing is more prevalent in rugby because you've got bigger guys and you've got wider neck circumferences and they're more prone to obstructive sleep apnea. And this is not just affecting performance, but this is affecting health. Because if you're putting the heart under stress yeah. during the day, during training, and then you're also putting your heart under stress during sleep by stopping breathing. The heart isn't recovering. And also that individual is more likely to be in that sympathetic activation, reduced heart rate variability, reduced resilience, increased sympathetic drive, and more prone to injury. So, and I don't want to be putting this out as a cure-all, but the, we'll continue along the lines and of applying breathing exercises because I suppose what we want to do in this conversation is to show that you, if you understand a little bit about your breathing, you can change states. You can upregulate, yeah. you can downregulate, you can optimize breathing. Your breathing can be more efficient. You're less likely to gas out. And I'm not saying for elite athletes or you know professional athletes to switch to 100% nasal breathing, Jacko. Mm. It's more kind of during the low intensity and moderate intensity stuff, nose breathe. When the intensity gets too high, switch to mouth breathing, but then to recover back to nose breathing. Yeah. Well, and I think also, Patrick, when you've when you've worked on some of the the good mechanics you're talking about, you know, you mentioned right at the beginning about the ribs moving, the diaphragm moving, and you've trained your diaphragm to work. When you switch to mouth breathing, you can stack everything going on beneath that can still be good rib movement, good diaphragmatic breathing, because you've taught yourself that just because you move to, but it's going to take time to, there was, there was a point I wanted to make when, that, when you mentioned about uh, the diaphragm um, and uh, when we're, when we're, um, when we, when we try to switch to nasal breathing, I noticed this myself. It was like, right. So if I've, since uh, I've, say I've been breathing like poorly for 10 years and when I go out running, I, I tend to breathe <laughs> shallow from the upper chest just because I switched to nasal breathing and we go, okay, that, that, that's shown to help stimulate and activate the diaphragm. I've still got this like habit that my brain has got associated with when I jog. So I switch to the nose and I go, <laughs> so I'm still beneath that, still doing that short, shallow breath, but just because I'm using my nose and it took some time to train that and improve that. And you, you then get to see the reverse of that. 
I now breathe through my nose, but when I cut with good mechanics, when I can't and I have to use my mouth, I'm then using mouth breathing, but with all those longer, slower breaths, using the diaphragm, getting the breathing. So I'm, I've got all of that good stuff underneath it. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not just a nose or mouth um, conversation because there's the benefits that you're going to get across too. And actually at the start, you, I did the whole like, oh, well, I'm nasal breathing now. I've read the oxygen advantage. I'm using my diaphragm. But reality was I was still yes. breathing quite poorly beneath that. Yeah. Um, and then point. with the nose... I, there was a one of the guys um, with the one, one of the professional teams I was working with. We uh, we just did three sessions, and um, he was booked in to have a nose operation. And after the third session, no, actually after the second session, he texts me. He goes, "My nose is so much better. I'm thinking about um, canceling yeah. my operation." And after yes. the third session, he actually cancelled his operation. Yeah, we've um, seen it, and we did a small pilot study with chronic rhinocitis in people with asthma in 2013, and it reduced symptoms of the nose by 70%. So when people feel that their nose is yeah. stuffy, okay, part of it can be due to a deviated septum. My septum is very, very badly deviated, but also part is due to inflammation yeah. and we can alleviate the inflammation there. So Jacko, some great points there. We're going to move on. Otherwise we'll be here all day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's so much to talk to. It's, this here is, seems to have gone back to square one. So improving anaerobic capacity and buffering capacity, this is a big one. And mm -hmm. I think this is huge. So we spoke about the pre-warm-up and halftime. So halftime, we said that players, when they're returning from going from the pitch to the dressing room, breathe nose, breathe low, and breathe slow to recover. But when halftime, when the players then are returning back to the pitch, Breathe nose low and slow to steady any nerves, but then do two or three strong breath holds. Because again, that's going to activate the spleen. That's going to increase blood flow to the brain. So for example, just on that very point there, physiologically, if you breathe in through your nose and out through your nose, and if you pinch your nose, you're holding your breath. Carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood and carbon dioxide will increase blood flow to the brain. And that's really, really important for focus and concentration. And also we spoke about better open airways. When you do that breath hold, you can feel, and I would say to, if somebody wants to test it, try it, you know, yeah. take a normal breath in through your nose, out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold and start walking around and go into a jog and keep relaxing into it. And then let go in through your nose and do that a few times and see what impact it has on concentration. And does it do anything to your nose? So, so that's just an idea going back to the pitch that you're doing the breathe nose low and slow, steadying the nerves, and then do two or three strong breath holds. And then we spoke about this off the ball, breathe nose low and slow, because of course this has been, you know, staying in the zone is a very interesting thing. And we spoke about this. There was a paper written on this back in 1996. Now that slide is after going away from me for some reason. <laughs> I'm, after, I'm totally looking at it totally different. Yeah. So off the ball, breathe nose low and slow to stay in the zone. That nasal breathing, it helps to keep the mind in a state of relaxation and alert at the same time. And this was with a paper done with... Travis and Dollier back in 1996, which is an interesting one and certainly got application. Um, post sprinting. So if you have a player who is really gassed out and they want to get recovery quick, again, as you pointed out, not to breathe fast and shallow, even though you want, you feel that way to do it. Because yeah. even if we just think of the human lungs, the greatest concentration of blood flow is in the lower lobes. We have to be breathing lower and even if it's a fuller breath, but breathe less breaths, but take bigger breaths. Now, don't overbreathe because you don't want to be overbreathing either. So there is a balance between the biochemistry and the biomechanics and the speed of your breathing. So consciously, you're gassed out, you want to recover. You could take it, for example, in through the mouth and breathe out slowly through the mouth if you're too gassed out. But any time that you can slow down the speed of the exhalation, you're going back into recovery. So let's move on to anaerobic training. Yeah, because this is a fantastic one because this is where we were doing, we, 
I remember feeling we in, in preseason, it would be like Monday morning would be like the worst anaerobic, like uh, <laughs> sort of shuttle training that we would do. And you'd feel sick on Sunday night just thinking about it, let alone what happens. Um, yeah, and I said I to you, imagine. that was like pure Maybe. grit and determination. I was a bit shocked when you told me um, the likelihood of where your SPO2 was dropping to compared to what it can be done with a breath yeah. guard. I was like, yeah. okay, we could have been a little bit more efficient. And, you know, you think about the anaerobic shuttle tests and it seems that the, one of the purposes anyway, without def, not seems, but one of the purposes of the anaerobic shuttle test is to put the body into an anaerobic state. And you can measure using pulse oximeter um, the fraction of your hemoglobin occupied by oxygen. And these are very s- simple devices. You can pick them up for maybe 30 or 40 pounds. They're worth having. And they're worth having from a number of different perspectives, but I think as much from a motivational point of view, if you do a sprint with your mouth open, your blood oxygen saturation will drop down to about 93%. If you do a sprint with your mouth closed, your blood oxygen saturation goes down to about 91%. If you do a sprint on a breath hold, your blood oxygen saturation will go into the 80s or even into the 70s. We don't want to go and blow 60, definitely not. We don't, we don't even want to go below 70. So the other aspect with, that's happening here is, Jacko, that it's not just if you do a sprint with your mouth closed, it's not just that your oxygen is dropping, but your carbon dioxide is increasing. And as oxygen is dropping, and this would have a stronger effect, of course, if you do a breath hold. If you do a breath hold, your blood oxygen saturation, as I said, drops down in, say, the mid-80s, low-80s and carbon dioxide increases to 50 millimeters of mercury plus. There's a hydrogen ion coming from the increased carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide in the blood forms carbonic acid, dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. The drop to blood oxygen saturation is also increasing hydrogen ion because the hydrogen ion doesn't get get oxidized because there's not sufficient oxygen getting to the muscle. Mm. And that hydrogen ion is associated with pyruvic acid to form lactic acid and then it dissociates into lactate and hydrogen ion. So the breath holding here is something that we do during training. And it's done during training to really push the body to make adaptations. That you're disturbing the blood acid base balance and it's forcing increased buffering capacity inside in the muscle. So here's a situation that you can add an extra load onto sprinting by doing nasal breathing, which is much tougher, and go another step further, breath holding. So do a 40 meter sprint on a breath hold. Have a 30 second recovery, do a 40 meter sprint. And I'm gonna show you a study and you're familiar with this study. Yeah, well, and just to say on that, like it's, it sounds a little bit like crikey, but if you think of when you're sprinting anyway, um, you know, you don't breathe, it's, sprinting is an anaerobic thing, meaning without oxygen, like we, it, it's not actually that bad to do. And what you're saying, and, and, and the science and the research is proving this, that there's, it's multifaceted in the effects you're going to get by just adding in the breath holds. You're getting the low oxygen. You've already talked about the, the spleen contraction, the benefits you get from that. The elevated levels of CO2, we're getting uh, the, the buffering capacity. But equally, you're exposing ourselves to those higher levels of CO2 to improve our carbon dioxide tolerance, which then has that effect on improving everything about our breathing, breathing rates as well. So you're getting you're getting more than just one thing yeah. um, that's yeah. going to really help with, you, really help with your, your, your physical performances. Yeah, and this was studied with 21 highly trained rugby union players um, in Australia over a four-week period. And basically, there were two groups. So you had one group who were doing sprinting with breath tolling, and 11 in that group. So it's called voluntary hypoventilation at low lung volume. Same as what we've been doing for 20 years And then you've got the other group who were doing sprinting with normal breathing. And they measured, they assessed it using a repeated sprintability test, which is a performance indicator in team sports. And basically this is, you know, you can imagine an athlete doing all out effort. They've got a very brief recovery before they have to do all out effort again. The results after four weeks of training and bearing in mind that these guys are highly trained and normally the fraction of an improvement here is not all that much. Yeah. But after four weeks of training, the group who were doing repeated sprintability, re- repeated sprints with breath tolling, increased from 9.1 reps before exhaustion to 14.9 reps before exhaustion. It's a huge, it's really an amazing result. 
And the group who were doing repeated sprints with normal breathing increased from 9.8 reps to 10.4 reps. And, and that's what you'd sort of expect, isn't it? Like in four weeks, it's not a very long time. We don't expect to break yeah. the world records in four weeks. So you get a small improvement. To get that, that nine, that's like 50 odd percent, isn't it? It's like, it, it, it's, it's a mad. huge result. And an anaerobic training session was dropped in the group who were doing the sprinting with Brett Tolling. Now, you know, it's, this is interesting. And, we, and even, even with this, we can go another angle here because players can get injured if they are doing mm. sprinting during the anaerobic uh, training. Oh, Patrick, could just say that's also, that's, pe- mm. that's, that's all they were doing. Yes. They weren't doing any of the other, improving their breathing, uh, all the stuff you've already no, talked about. No, that's all they were doing. That's all they were doing. Yes. That's yeah. it. That's and all I think they were that's doing. The, the message for people is, uh, or one of the things I'd like to try to get across is like, it's, it, it's just like a tweak. It's just an extra thing to like that we're going to do because yes. you're going to be breathing, you're going to be training anyway. It's nothing extra in terms of like adding another another thing you've got to do it's like it's it's just going to be just knit it in to embed it into what you're yeah. doing and you're going to yeah. get the benefits massively and only if you do some, one of these things sometimes yeah totally and i think that's a key point because they were already doing anaerobic training yeah so all they did was superimpose breath holding on one group and they didn't do about that many like they did they did two sets a week in the first week and i think it increased to three or four sets a week in the in the fourth week and it's fairly taxing. Warren's protocol is pretty taxing. So the description yeah, would be seconds. It you don't seven, have to do that. seven reps. You don't have to do it at all. Like a protocol that we use in the oxygen advantage would be take a normal breath in and out, pinch your nose, hold after you're warmed up, of course. So warm up first of all, and then take a normal breath in and out, pinch your nose and hold and sprint for 40 meters. And then you have 30 seconds of recovery. So it's not a departure every 30 seconds, but you have 30 second recovery. Yeah. Not much in the difference, but it's a few extra seconds. Yeah. And then sprint again for 40 meters on the breath hold exhale and a 30 seconds recovery. And do five reps per set and do yeah. one set every second day. And on week two, increase it to six reps per set. And on week three, increase it to seven reps per set. And you could go week four, eight reps per set, and then that's matching Woron's protocol. Yeah. So the point is that it would be too taxing straight off the bat to do eight reps, but start off a bit easier. Yeah. And maybe if overload, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I if think you feel... one thing, could you say, Patrick, just sure. if you, um, for someone that's watching this, maybe is, is they, they're quite new to breath holding, they might think that because um, uh, we sort of went over it quite quickly that that it's done on it's done on after a normal exhale and, and why it's yes. done after an exhale rather than because I think a lot of people might think that um, if I'm going to do a breath hold to help me with the breath I'm going to take a breath in and then I'm going to do it so if, yeah. if just, yeah, I think just, point. just for someone that hasn't really come across it before yeah so the reason being is because it's much stronger so what we want to do is during the breath hold we want to lower the blood oxygen saturation we want to increase carbon dioxide so we want to disrupt homeostasis we want to add an extra load onto the body if you breathe in and hold your breath, you're less likely to drop your blood oxygen saturation because you're taking a lungs full of air. And the reason that we can drop blood oxygen saturation during a breath hold is during the breath hold, cells continue to extract oxygen from the blood, but you haven't replenished it through breathing. Yeah. So if you have a normal inhalation and a normal exhalation through the nose, and then we have the players active, pinch their nose, hold their nose, and sprint while holding their nose for 40 meters, and then to let go and to get breathing in through the nose and recover. And using the slow breathing as recovery, or even they could be doing, say, if they wanted to dump some carbon dioxide, take a normal breath in through the nose, a full big breath in, and a full big breath out through the nose, get rid of some carbon dioxide, and it allows the next sprint to be easier. And yeah, it is, a, is an important point that if you breathe in and hold your breath, you're less likely to drop blood oxygen saturation. And it is much stronger to breathe in, breathe out, and then hold your breath. And it's also helping to strengthen the diaphragm. And this is coming back into the scrum and functional movement and everything else. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on, Jack. Oh, we're getting there. <laughs> Got 25 so. slides left to go. <laughs> so we spoke about nasal breathing sprinting. That's pretty yeah. tough. And that's adding an extra load to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis. And I'm hopefully my slide now, my slide isn't moving. And this is the thing about PowerPoints. Um, 
And the next one then we spoke about was breath holds sprinting. So this was the anaerobic shuttle test. And I'm just going to put on a different slide here. One moment. And this is in terms of we spoke about the blood oxygen saturation. Um, so the blood oxygen saturation. And now I can't even control my cursor. So I have absolutely no idea what's going on with that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Now, one second there. Sorry, guys. Sorry. These are the things that happen. And I won't be editing this. So yeah, so during sprinting with the mouth open, we said that the SpO2 drops down to about 93%. You can test this, get a pulse oximeter, mm. do your sprint and see where your blood oxygen saturation goes. Now, of course, it's going to vary person to person. With nasal breathing, expect it to go down to about 91%. And with breath holding, it will go down into the 80s. And even some people will go down into the 70s. But it's not just the oxygen that we are affecting here. We're also affecting carbon dioxide and we're improving tolerance to CO2. So we spoke about this. Now, say, for example, you have athletes who don't want to sprint and mm -hmm. or, for example, they want to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis, but without trauma. You can do it during jogging. Mm -hmm. And this could be for also for players who may be rehabilitation, rehabbing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So if they want to, to maintain their condition, take a normal breath in through the nose and out through the nose and pinch the nose and jog or even walk with your breath held. And then when you resume breathing, it's the shark fit exercise from the oxygen advantage. You resume breathing with normal breathing and you could do a departure here every 30 seconds or every minute. So jogging is another option and you'll still get a fairly strong effect. Yeah. So a few ideas and when we're talking about breathing, we have to consider sleep and breathing through the nose is absolutely critical during sleep. And I wrote a review article that was co-authored with two ear, nose and throat doctors that it's available on PubMed. And it's the application of breathing re-education for the phenotypes of obstructive sleep apnea. A couple of points in this. I would suspect that at least 50% of rugby players are mouth breathing during sleep. And the reason that I would suspect it is because that's normal in that population. In, in the normal population, in the adult population, it's about 50%. No one should wake up with a dry mouth in the morning because if they are waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, they're not likely to feel that rested and that full deep sleep. So nasal breathing is absolutely key. There's a few options, Jacko. One is the tape that we use, which is called Myo Tape. Now, because beards are very fashionable at the moment, it's not going to work. But it will work with old-fashioned people like myself <laughs> that shave and go through the hassle of shaving every now and again. So this tape here works this way. You stretch it, a good stretch, and it brings the lips together. And even snoring, because I often say to you know students, make the sound of a snore through the nose, sorry, through the mouth. It goes a bit like this. <sighs> And now what I'd like you to do is to close your mouth and try and snore through your mouth. And you see that mouth snoring stops as soon as you, you get the mouth closed. No snoring, it snore is like this. And now if we have very light and slow breathing, so breathing slowly in through the nose and a very slow and relaxed breath out and a slow breath in through the nose and a relaxed slow breath out. And as you're breathing really slowly, snore through your nose. Yeah. And you'll find that it's more difficult. You can't make that noise when you breathe in. Yeah. It's not so. as much at all. Now, you will find that some people with a deviated septum, they will have some snoring. However, we never spoke about the bolt score. And if the bolt score is low, breathing is faster and harder. So in order to, for example, improve everyday breathing patterns, we can assess it using the bolt score. And this was one professor has put this to the test, Kyle Kiesel. And he's a professor in physical therapy in Evansville University in the United States. He looked at 51 individuals and he looked at their breathing across three different dimensions, biochemistry, biomechanical and psychophysiological. And he concluded that an easy way to determine functional breathing is breath hold time. Now, he uses four questions as well. You don't need the four questions but the breath hold time would be key. And that breath hold time was the bolt score or the control pause from Buteco. 
So if any players want to assess our screen for how well are they breathing, there's a simple test. There's two simple tests. One is the ball score. Take a normal breath in and out through the nose and pinch the nose and hold and time it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. And when you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the first involuntary movement of the breathing muscles, let go, breathe in through your nose and your breathing should be normal at the end. So it's not the maximum length of breath told. His conclusion was that if your bolt score is greater than 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. Now, I would imagine that some players are going to be a little bit shocked when they measure their bolt score yeah. and they realize it's 10 seconds. Yeah. It doesn't matter at this point because now you've found something that can be holding you back. Yeah. Because people with a lower bolt score, Jacko, they're going to have disproportionate breathlessness during exercise. No matter how hard they train, they will tend to plateau. And maybe the strength and conditioning coach is putting this down to lack of condition. Maybe, you know, maybe the player has got a breathing pattern disorder that's been completely overlooked because yeah. typically... But they didn't even know it themselves. They don't even know it themselves, yeah. And as the saying goes, you, you don't know what you don't know. You know, so, so yeah, so it, that test, the bow score is a very good test for just functional breathing. And if you wanted to measure then what's called the maximum breathlessness test, this is the maximum tolerance of breathlessness. Take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold and walk at a normal pace and count how many paces that you can hold your breath for. So you're walking, holding your breath and how many paces can you hold your breath up until an absolute maximum? you should have at least 60 paces and the goal will be 80 to 100. Now, coming back to the guys with beards, because I forgot to show them enough. Ah, yeah. With the taping, and I would say to people, absolutely, if you're, if you're, and I'm sure you have plenty of stories, Jacko, that rugby players are going, they're staying in rooms and one guy is... Sorry, yes, bad, 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 bad times. <laughs> when you're roomed with one of the people that is like... <laughs> Everyone in the whole hotel can hear them. But it must be very, very common because when you're dealing with bigger guys, they have definitely a, a good, you know, an increased risk of sleep disorder. Yeah, bigger breathing. next circumference, you're more susceptible yeah, to. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. So the other option is this here, and this is to get them out closed. And this is a paper tape that you'll pick up in any chemist or drugstore. And you just fold over a tab either side, close them out. Mm -hmm. Straight over. Yeah. Now, it's not just about some, some guy saying, well, tonight I'm going to tape up and no, make sure you can breathe through your nose and start breathing through your nose during the day first. Do the nose unblocking exercise that Jack and myself went through earlier on. And also a good way is to downregulate. So we'll be drawing to a close here, but we'll give one yeah. kind of final thing. To downregulate before sleep is very, very important. And... This is talking about activating the body's relaxation response and to do it for 10 or 15 minutes. And it's also a very good tool to improve concentration and focus and attention. So this would be when the player might be in a hotel room, they have an important game the next day. It's very important that you can downregulate, that you can bring your body into relaxation, that you can get that deep sleep. You yeah. want to be waking up in the morning of a match and you want to be absolutely alert yeah, well, I'm and stopping to... yourself from worrying about, like, because exactly. often what it would be is the night before, it's like your mind, you, you struggle to sleep because your mind's thinking yes. about the big game and yes. you run through all these scenarios in your head. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the time you just haven't got anything else to think about. So it's a, it's a little yes. bit of like mindfulness or it's just, you know, being yeah. able to focus in on the breathing gets you all those yeah. benefits of the sleep. But equally, it's can like you always talk about calming that racing mind. Yeah. For a big totally. game, the, the mind is going to race um, unless yeah. we do something about it. Yeah, and a very simple way would be you have one hand on chest, one hand just above navel. Tune into your breathing pattern and slow down the speed of the air coming into your nose, almost that your breath is imperceptible and have a really relaxed and a slow exhalation. So you re really want to have a, a long, a slow, relaxed exhalation, a normal exhalation, but a slow and relaxed one. And then taking a very soft and gentle breath into the nose and a really relaxed and a slow exhalation. And the objective is to breathe less air for about 10 or 15 minutes. And you're breathing less air, you should feel air hunger. And that will stimulate the vagus nerve. And a slow and prolonged exhalation stimulates the vagus nerve. 
And this information is fed from the body back to the brain because when we breed nose low and slow, the brain is interpreting that the body is in a safe environment because we have to think that the brain is always there to protect the body. And whenever we are stressed as human beings, we breed fast and shallow. So when we breathe fast and shallow, yeah. the brain is in that state of constant alertness. And when we breathe slow and low, the body is telling the brain, everything is okay. Now you can go into relaxation. Now you can have your deep sleep. And the time to do this is not wait. Don't wait until an important game. Start doing it now. And bring these tools into your everyday life because these tools are not just for rugby. These tools are for everyday life. Focus concentration, attention span, energy, good deep sleep, functional breathing, and they're tools that we can all use and we do all use. Yeah, 100%. So Jacko, um, if somebody wants to make contact with you. Yeah, um, so my email is davidjacksonfitness at gmail.com. Uh, website is rootedlife.co.uk or on Instagram, uh, Jacko Human Flag. Um, I guess we can put some links in in the description we can we can to. do that and with oxygen advantage it's oxygenadvantage.com and i've got a couple of books out there as well i've got eight books or nine books one is the oxygen advantage which is kind of sports performance one is called the breathing cure and i've got a new book that will be coming out and that's called it's called focus i haven't got the full title yet but it's based on focus so yeah give it a go and listen Put your comments. If you're an athlete, please put your mm. comments in and let us know how you're getting on. We've been using these tools for 20 years. We've been using them with um, professional athletes, military, first responders, corporate people, everyday walks of life. We've seen the results. Let us know how you're doing. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. Cheers. Bye.